Um, so apologies about that now, right? Okay. Okay, you should see it there now shortly. Uh, I welcome back everybody. We're having a few little technical difficulties with this online system. I suppose this presentation was meant to be a physical presentation in Galway and we're all struggling with the new world that we're involved in. Um, hopefully this will go well. If you have any problems, just leave us know. This session will be chaired by Yang Ying from NUI Galway. So I'm going to hand control over to Yang Ying and I'm going to um, stop my video. So Yang, you might introduce uh, the next session. We might proceed with the first presentation from Benten Wu. Thank you. Thanks, Tara. Um, yeah. Hello, everyone. My name is Benten Wu. Uh, can you create a nice slide? Yeah. Yeah, I'm delighted to be here to deliver my recent research. The title is about the application of carbon-based conducting materials to uh, resist toxicity shock. And the research background is that based on our previous studies, we found uh, the application of carbon of, of conductive materials, especially nanomaterial graphene, can enhance um, by methane, can enhance anaerobic digestion as illustrated in left in left slide. Now move to the ro uh, right slide. Tara, can you click? Yeah. Uh, we found the one gram per liter of graphene can enhance bimethane production rate by 20 to 30 percent, which is significant. It means in the future we can reduce the feedstock retention time, we can reduce the digest volume. So, based following on this, we'd like to see the application of carbon based conductive materials, for example, parcha, to resist acidic shock. Uh, we know parcha can be produced from biomass or digested, which means cheaper. Parcha may be capable of connecting bacteria and archaea like a bridge, thus improving biomethane production efficiency. Uh, in terms of acidic condition, we know it favors hydrogen production. Hydrogen diffusion has been considered as a conventional, as a traditional electron transport process. In this process, it involves hydrogen diffusion, hydrogen hydrogen production, which is kind of low efficient. So following on this, we move to the next nice slide. Um, uh, we, we, so we used, we used thin stitch as a feedstock in this study. Thin stitch is a kind of whiskey byproduct. We made its characteristics as shown in table one. We find uh, thin stitch is in a quite low pH, as low as four. Just like I said, uh, low pH environment favors hydrogen production. So that's why we apply the carbon-based conducting conductive materials to somehow shift the indirect uh, electron transfer to direct electron transfer. Thus, in recover the bimethane production and uh, stabilize by anaerobic digestion process. So the research question here is that next slide, please. Um, the research question here is that can nanomaterial graphene and cost-effective pressure in digestion of thin stitch resist acidic shock? In terms of acidic shock, here is that we, re we adjusted the pH to 5.5 in digesters for two days. Then we readjusted the pH to the neutral, following with the addition of graphene and parcha. Parcha was in different dosages. This is based on the lower uh, electrical conductivity of parcha. So during the experiment, the volatile fatty acids accumulation, the bimethane production, and the microbial, microbial community were analyzed. Now move to the next slide. 
figure one shows the bimethane production uh, over time in different groups. We found uh, graphing addition uh, lead to an increase of 11% of bimethane production compared with the control. But in terms of power charge, uh, both on the high and the low dosages, power charge management didn't result in apparent uh, promotion effects on bimethane yield but shorten the lag time as shown in table two. Table two shows the estimated parameters. Now move to the uh, volatile fatty acid accumulation. Tara, please. Yeah, uh, we found the graphing addition significantly stimulated the propionate oxidation, which means um, diet direct in interspecies electron transfer was triggered during propionate oxidation. Move to next slide. We analyze the microbial community. Uh, figure three shows the bacteria and archaea at the genus level. And I won't go through all of the bacteria and archaea because it involves a lot of general. But to be more clear, uh, the significant difference between the control and the graphing group on relative abundance uh, was, was analyzed as shown in figure four. We found uh, with the additional graphing for bacteria, uh, there are three uh, generals were increased significantly, significantly compared with the control. For archaea, we found uh, methylacetylene played an important role in digestion of thin silage. For for bacteria, but only the third one, DTO014, has been uh, reported had been found that could function diet. So com combined with findings from other studies, we think we hypothesize. DTO014 and genus methanosacina are highly responsible for functioning diet. So here, in terms of our conclusion, now move to the next slide. Yeah. Thank you. We found the graph amendment uh, in, can improve, uh, could improve biomethane production by 11% and accelerated the degradation of propionate. And in terms of power char, power char amend addition just shortened the lag time, but failed to enhance biomethane yield. We think of diet responsible thin trophies like DTO14 and Archaea methanosacina were significantly enriched with the graphene addition. So that's all. Thanks for your listening. Any questions are welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ben Ten. Uh, excellent presentation. So we'll keep questions to the end of the session. So the next presentation is from, I do apologize for my pronunciation, Zhang, Zhang Wang. Uh, and he's a PhD yes. candidate in National University of Ireland, Galway. So over to you, Zhang Zhang. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Zhongzhu Wang from the Ximing Group from AUIG. Today, I will give the brief introduction of my recent study. My topic is about the impact um, of the total solid content on anaerobic digestion of the pig manure and food waste incides into the shifting of the methanogenic pathway. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, currently, the generation of the carbon dioxide, uh, nutrient, and <coughs> renewable energy is a key challenge facing all the economies globally. The ag agriculture sector, in particular animal production, plays a major role in the economy of the island. From the picture of the greenhouse gas emission by the sector from the 2010 to the 2017, agriculture sector contributes the, around the 13, uh, 33% to the nation greenhouse uh, emission. As, uh, due to, uh, according to the EU regulation, Ireland uh, have to reduce the uh, national greenhouse gas emission by the 13% from the 2005 levels by the 2013. Um, for this situation, this increased pressure on the agriculture sector to reduce the um, or to mitigate, uh, mitigate greenhouse gas emission. Um, every year, it's estimated uh, that around uh, 3.2 uh, million tons of pig, pig, uh, pig slurry with the total solid content of the 4.5% was generated in Ireland. And it's well related to some of the environment issues such as the greenhouse gas emission and, and if we without any treatment. 
Mm, presently, the letter spreading uh, is the conventional mm, approach for the chicken mm, management. Um, during this process, most of the organic matter will be consumed <coughs> in the uh, used way and the wealth generation and missing emissions. Obviously, this approach is not according to the sustainable content of the economic de development. Um, for this suggestion, it's joined to a demand of the appropriate technology for the pig meal treatment. Uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, an every direction as a renewable uh, and eco-friendly technology has been applied to the waste uh, management for the past decades. For the conventional digestion, the generator of the large amount of the digester with the high moisture undermines the economy of visibility of the AD system. According to the previous study by Avgroup, uh, the cost of transporting digester to farmland could be accounted for the 13 uh, to the 70 uh, percent of the uh, total operating cost and therefore minimize the digestive generation is our effective approach to reduce the, the operating cost so we just uh, considering about to increase the TS content of the substrate fed in the digester and um, there is several advantages for the dry and every digestion with the TS content higher than the 15 percent such as the uh, reduced digestive size or the volume or the decrease the energy consumption and uh, avoiding the higher cost of the liquid digest management and so on. However, there's still some the, uh, uh, setbacks for the dry and every digestion. Estimated TS content could affect the performance in terms of emission <coughs> reduction uh, due to higher ammonia concentration, higher the volatile the fatty acid concentration, as well as the limitation of the uh, metabolic intermediate transfer. Therefore, uh, we just try to the, uh, uh, investigate what kind of the effect of the missing production along with the elevated TS content. Uh, and, uh, uh, and what is the critical microbe for the sporting wet or the dry energy digestion? Next. Uh, so we just uh, conducted, uh, uh, estimated, uh, established four types of the digester operate at different TS content, ranging from the 5% to the 20%, and with the pig manure and food waste and substrate, uh, and the temperature is around the 37% uh, degree centigrade. Um, the fixture issues the missing production and the different TS content. And two peaks uh, occur in the digester with the TS higher than 5% during digestion. And uh, from the result of the uh, community with the spe specific, uh, spe specific missing year digester with the TS below 20% uh, was similar, while the 20% uh, 20 uh, 20 TS digester up to a relative low the, um, specific missing year. Um, by uh, with the decline by the 11 percent. Moreover, uh, Poland and neck fees with the increased TS was observed especially with the TS con uh, 20 percent TS content. Next. As last, please. Uh, as we know, WFA um, is the main metabolite in intermediates uh, in the anaerobic digestion, and this is the critical uh, critical criterion for the AD process stability. <coughs> this picture shows the evolution of the WFA in digestion operates at the different initial TS content. We can find the two peaks of the total so where uh, where fee was observed in digestion with the TS higher than the 5% corresponding to the missing uh, production. Obviously, where fee was uh, gradually accumulated in the digestion uh, with the higher uh, TS content during the specific period. We also found that the uh, propionic acid was gradually accumulated at the beginning and started to be great when all the other acids almost consumed and uh, still considerable acid remain at the end of the experiment in the digestion with the TS uh, con uh, content of the 20%. Uh, next slide, please. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, uh, previous. Uh, this picture is, is shows the shifting of the methanogenic pathway in the wet and dry digester. 
from the future, we can find the SD classic uh, mesogenesis was uh, always overwhelming the <coughs> pr uh, predominant in the Western digestion. However, obvious the shifting of the mesogenesis pathway was observed in the dry digestion. The proportion of the hydro uh, hydrogen traffic in communities increased sharply, and um, while the ST ST classic the mesogen uh, quickly declined for uh, uh, during the active the missing production period. Clearly, hydrogen pathway dominate at the end of the uh, dry and digestion. Uh, in summary, here uh, here the main foundation for the for my uh, for the present study. Uh, the spe specific missing year reduced at the the uh, twenty percent TS content. Two peaks of the total uh, uh, valid fast acid and uh, daily uh, missing production was observed. And the shifting of the missing um, uh, mesogenic pathway for the ST classic to the uh, mixed trophic and then to the hydrogen trophic in the dry and the digestion. Uh, that's all. Thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you for that, uh, Xiong Zhang. Uh, greatly appreciated. Our, our next presentation is uh, Shun Wang. Uh, and he will present on an important role of anaerobic digestion on the removal of antibiotic resistome. So over to you, Sean. Hello. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, today, uh, sorry. Uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone. Today, my topic is the uh, uh, important role of anaerobic uh, digestion on the removal of antibiotic resistance. So, <clears throat> listen, please. As we know, antibiotics have been widely used for preventing and treating infections since the 1960s. Uh, 40s and the application of antibiotics showed selective pressure on microbes and developed resistant bacteria in human and animal gas, uh, which is subsequently in introduced uh, into the environment. And so nowadays, antibiotic resist resistance spreading as has become an um, emerging public health concern and the death caused by M AMR may reach to 10 million in 2050. So recently, animal waste, food waste, and wastewater treatment plants are reported as important reservoirs of antibiotic resistant bacteria and resistant genes. So now, our digestion is widely used for treating bare waste and producing perfume, but the bad safety has attracted little attention. So, I would like to investigate the role of AD on the removal of antibiotic resistance. List, please. List, please. Yeah. So we investigate the abundance of antibiotic resistant genes in different bio waste and collect from Galway, that is, food waste, pig manure, and sludge. And we found that. 146 and 170 uh, types of LGS and MGS were found in pig manure and the sludge, respectively. And the total COVID reached as high as, as 10 to the 10th, among which tetracycline and um, amylocloxacin and MLSB recent genes were the most abundant ones. This may attribute to the different types of, uh, of antibiotic used on farms and human health care. And it was mentioned that about 10 to, 10 to the seventh of ARGS was also found in food waste, including some ARGS which should pay attention to, such as carbapenemides, encoding genes, and uh, SBOs genes. Let's please. So we investigate the inactivating inactivation of carbapenemides producing enterobacteria, that is CPE, during the 
during AD because CBE infections are high associated with increased morbidity and mortality, mortality, and it has become the major public health concern. And we can see from the future, the results indicated that the, the AD can inactivate CBE and the high test content was more efficient in eliminating CPE. Besides, the total volatile fatty acid concentration was found to be the significant factor for inactivating CPE. The results have re reference value for bad safety during AD, which can confer bad waste to bad gas. At least, please. And we also investigate the removal of ARGS and more biogenetic elements during waste and dry iron digestion. And we found that both waste and dry AD can reduce ARGS. After 14 days, the total ARGS decreased from uh, 6.75 to um, 10 to the length to uh, 6, uh, 3.91, 10 to the S copies. Uh, in dry AD, white only decreased from four, uh, four times 10 to the lines to one times 10 to lines copies in wet AD. However, tercycling and MLSB resistant genes still remained as main abundant after AD. And from the heat map on the right side, you can see that after AD, most ARGs were reduced and they are shown in green. And about seven LGS and MGS were enriched in dry AD, while there were 14 LGS and MGS were enriched in wet AD. The results indicated that dry AD has, has better performance than wet AD on the removal of LGS and MGS. Next, please. The take home message is that bad waste are important reservoirs of antibiotic resistance, and the dry AD has better performance on the removal of antibiotic resistance. That's all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shun. Uh, a very nice presentation. I, I think this is a, a very important issue when we're looking at application of digestate to land, and I know in the past. Some of the larger superstores in the UK objected to spreading of digestate, so we might have some questions on that. The next presentation is from Shasha Kui uh, on food waste, food waste fermentation for carbon source production and application and denitrification of wastewater. So over to you, Sasha. Good morning, everyone. Mm, I'm Shasha from Xinming's group. My presentation is about uh, food waste fermentation for carbon source production and the application in denitrification of wastewater. Next, please. Thank you. Many kinds of food waste are rich in carbon hydrate, which are suitable for producing carbon rich fermentation liquid. Lactic acid, VFAs, and uh, polysaccharide are what. Uh, widely fermentation compounds in the fermentation liquid from food waste. These organics might can be used as carbon source for denitrification. Next, please. Thank you. Uh, biological nitrogen removal is widely used in wastewater treatment plant due to cost effective and simple operation. The nitrogen is usually uh, removed through nitrification and the denitrification process. The heterotrophic uh, denitrification using organics as electro donor uh, will be limited because of low carbon and nitrogen ratio of the raw wastewater. The nitrate follow wastewater treatment plant effort will result in surface water Neutrification in order to uh, uh, remove the nitrogen in wastewater. Some kind of chemical uh, carbon source were often added in denitrification process as uh, external carbon source, which increase the operational cost, 
uh, of wastewater treatment plant. So the production and the composition of fermentation liquid from food waste and uh, the de uh, denitrification with this uh, produced uh, fermentation liquid need to be investigated. Uh, Next, please. Uh, there should some main results. Uh, the TCOD concentration increased to uh, around uh, 54.5 gram per liter. Uh, so the ratio of SCOD to TCOD was around uh, 90%. That means that uh, most, uh, most uh, COD in the fermentation liquid was uh, soluble. Uh, the amount, uh, next please. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, this this slide, the ammonia and the, the nitrogen uh, concentration was low, so the ratio of the uh, TCOD to the total nitrogen was around 174, uh, indicating that the fermentation liquid was rich in current source. Uh, that was good for the denitrification reaction. Uh, next uh, slide. Thank you. The soluble, um, soluble uh, polysaccharide was the major organic compounds of the uh, fermentation liquid, following by the lactic, VFA, and uh, protein. With the uh, with the presence of production inhibition and the acidic condition, the VFA, VFA production was inhibited, and the Carbohydrate was covered to the lactic acid, not uh, VFA. Uh, also, the low pH also hindered the uh, hydrolysis of the protein. So, most, um, most uh, polysaccharide was soluble, which would be benefited to the um, uh, denitrification reaction also. And here uh, we can see that. Uh, Acetic acid was a major component of the VFA. The fermentation liquid was further used for uh, denitrification. Next, please. Here we can find uh, compared with the sodium acetic uh, acid as counter with the fermentation liquid as carbon source. The uh, total nitrogen removal efficiency reached seven, uh, eighty-seven point four percent. That means fermentation liquid could provide enough carbon source for nitrogen removal of low uh, carbon to nitrate ratio waste water. Through further analysis, there was no obvious difference between two carbon sources on TCOD, DOC, SUVA, UV 254, uh, 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 and protein in efferent. Uh, this result shows potential of using uh, food waste fermentation liquid as a denitrification carbon source. And uh, fermentation liquid uh, could uh, re reduce the cost of chemical uh, carbon, uh, carbon source addition and uh, meet the efferent uh, discharge standard. So I think in the future, maybe uh, we can use the fermentation liquid to re uh, replace the uh, carbon source. Uh, that's all. Thank you for your listening. Thank you very much, Sasha. Very interesting presentation, and we will have questions at the end. Our next presentation is from Leah Chua Tan uh, on addition of activated carbon to facilitate faster fast fat degradation and promoting faster methane production. So over to you, Leah. Uh, thank you very much, Jerry, for the introduction. Uh, next, place, next slide, please, Sarah. Yes, thank you. Uh, so I'm, my name is Leigh. I'm a postdoc researcher in Peatlands Lab. And as mentioned, I'll give a snapshot uh, image of the project that focused on addition of activated carbon for fat degradation and methane production. Next, please. So uh, fat is actually one of the ma three major components of organic waste. And if you compare it to proteins and carbohydrates, it actually has three times more um, methane production. 
However, unfortunately in AD, this is actually not used, utilized very well. It actually physically removed from the wastewater stream because fat when degraded uh, produces long chain fatty acids or LCFA. And this causes an issue in operation because of its complex nature of insoluble, insoluble nature and also accumulates over time. It also tends to coat the organisms and this leads to poor microbe to microbe or substrate to microbe interaction. And this results for inhibition of microbial activity resulting to prolonged degradation time. Next, please. So uh, this project uh, proposed a cost effective approach by adding a external conductive material to the AD such as activated carbon, which is also a known absorbent. Now the activated carbon can act as a bridge to enhance interaction and has been reported to improve methane production, but hasn't been looked into for fat rich waste water. Next, please. So this project first started in batch operation uh, using olate as the model substrate. We added activated carbon in the bottle and then for inoculum we use a crushed granular sludge so that this can improve the interaction between the sludge material and substrate. We first check the dosage concentration and this results you see here is that uh, you can see a decrease in lag phase time if you increase the activated carbon, uh, meaning there was a faster methane generation by 900%. However, there's also a consequence at higher concentration, and we see a lower maximum methane yield at higher concentration of activated carbon. Now we, as we associate this to potentially the higher absorption percentage at, um, at the higher concentration, then leading to less substrate availability for methane production. Uh, next, please. Now, when we check uh, grass versus granules to see if contact surface time between the material and the sludge is important, we didn't really see a huge difference. Now, this could indicate that the microbe to material interaction might not be the main mechanism. Onto the next slide, please. Now, when we did the degradation profile of Olate AD, we see in this graph that essentially activated carbon enhanced both acetogenesis and methanogenesis step. Uh, next, please. This is because if you focus on palmitate, which is the main degradating product of oleate and also the main bottleneck in LCF accumulation, there was a clear shift in degradation profile about five days faster if you add activated carbon. And you can say that this alleviated inhibition of palmitate degradation leading to faster volatile fatty acid production, which is 60% acetate. Now, if you focus on the VFA graph, we can see that there was also both faster production and consumption of fatty acids. Now the image, the bottle image you see there at the right corner uh, shows you the physical representation of a bottle with and without activated carbon at the, at the same sampling point. So you can see that with activated carbon, we can see that the solution itself is clear, which indicates that the faster degradation occurred. Uh, onto the next slide. So finally, in the, in, in the last um, experiment uh, that I would like to show, we tested two things. First, if you applied real fat rich wastewater, such as dairy wastewater, without removing the fat from the waste stream, uh, will it be will it be applicable? And also we try, wanted to see how long the, um, the accumulation or the production of methane can occur in a long cycling phase. So here we use a sequential batch fed reactor and uh, we uh, operated for four cycles of 30 day HRT. Now, in order to not lose the activated carbon, we we kept it into a container and poke holes in it so that every time we put in new dairy wastewater and drain it, the activated carbon remains in the system. Uh, next, next slide, please. There we go. Uh, so here is the result of the four cycles to 30 day HRT. And uh, the red one shows the reactor with activated carbon. We can immediately see that there was a faster, higher and stable methane production and operation along all four cycles. Now, when we talk about fatty acids, we didn't really see much VFA for both reactors. And then for LCFA, that the the, uh, the uh, detection was mainly palmitate and oleate, but that was in the suspension. As I mentioned, LCFA is both insoluble and soluble, and we have no idea what it is occurring in the sludge itself. We need to take the entire solution uh, and sample it to see actually what's the entire LCFA concentration. Now, uh, onto the next slide. Now, in conclusion uh, from this project, the snapshot of this project, we saw uh, three main important things. Activated carbon immediately showed shorter lag phase time and then producing quicker methane production. Um, it also impacts the degradation process of fatty acids, leading to faster degradation. Now, when we operated in a cyclic manner in the reactor, we saw more stable and high methane production with activated carbon. Mechanism itself is unclear, um, but it does suggest that it's a combination between absorption and direct interspecies electron transfer. Now, this means that the activated carbon acts as a substitute 
to alleviate LCFA coating that it shifts from coating from the organisms but to the activate carbon. And then we can also act as a bridge for interaction between bacteria and archaea itself for faster electron transfer. Now for further risks that should be considered um, in the microbial community analysis should be checked to see which organisms are in play. We can also see particle size and alternative material has been, has been discussed in previous um, uh, uh, presentation. Finally, two things, and most important thing, what's the limitation of activated carbon before no enhancements is seen? Is it when it's saturated, it's over? And then we have to find out how to adopt this in a more continuous high rate reactor operation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Leah. Uh, an excellent presentation. I, I, I believe I'm co-authoring a paper with you, so I, I'm very impressed with the work that you're doing. Um, our next presentation is from Armando Olivia, and he's going to present on anaerobic digestion of lignocelloisic materials. This is the holy grail of anaerobic digestion. Can we deal with the lignocelloisic biomass as well? as the wet organic material. So looking forward to this, Armando, over to you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for um, introducing me. Today I'm going to talk about a part of my research work that concerns uh, the anaerobic digest, the effect of pretreatment on anaerobic digestion of uh, lignocellulosic material, in particular today uh, about the uh, in this impact on hazelnut skin, skin. Next slide, please. Firstly, I would like to explain why lignocellulosic materials are used to produce renewable energy. Lignocellulosic materials are the most abundant bioresource on the planet, and they can be taken as a, a waste material from agricultural, municipal, and industrial activities, generally at low cost. Also, the use of uh, lignocellulosic material for biofuels production does not create conflicts between food and energy production. One of the most suitable use for lignocellulosic biomass is methane production through anaerobic digestion. However, anaerobic digestion with no pretreatment is usually not so effective because of the high stability of uh, this biomass to the enzymatic attack. The structure of um, lignocellulosic biomass mainly consists of cellulose, hemicellulose, and lignin, and in particular, in particular, hemicellulose and lignin form a physical barrier around cellulose. This is the main reason why lignocellulosic material usually cannot undergo directly anaerobic digestion, but pretreatment are required. Also, the crystallinity and the degree of polymerization, as well as the accessible surface area, affect the AD process. Finally, up to 10% of uh, lignocellulosic material are composed of non-bonded material called extractives, which mainly uh, consist of, of not bonded, bonded sugar and protein. Next slide, please. Several pretreatments can be carried out to improve the biogas production from uh, lignocellulosic biomass with the main aim of enhancing the hydrolysis, the hydrolysis step by improving access to fermentable sugar. This can be obtained by removing lignin or hemicellulose and by decreasing the degree of polymerization and crystallinity of the cellulosic component of uh, biomass. In particular, organosol is a chemical pretreatment in which lignocellulosic material are mixed with an organic solvent and heated to dissolve lignin, leaving the cellulose in the solid phase. Also, partial, hydroly partial hemicellulose hydrolysis and an increase of porosity occur. Can you click, please? Before moving on with the pretreatment and the experimental setup, I would like to give you some information about the specific substrate. Hazelnut global production is reported to be half a million tons per year, and this production is increasing year by year in the last 10 years. Even if the skin represents only uh, about 5% of the fruit mass, this part of the fruit have a very high bulk density and this creates a storage problem. Only a few authors investigated this substrate for biofuel production. The chemical composition present in literature show an high lignin content for 34%. Um, cellulose and hemicellulose are reported to be 11 and 20% of the dry mass, respectively. Next slide, please. A 
after this introduction to the topic, we can move with the experimental part. The organosol pretreatment was performed using a 50% solution of methanol at 130, 160, and 200 degrees with and without sulfuric acid as a catalyst for the reaction. The pretreatments were performed in a steel reactor, adding 20 grams of each material and 200 ml of solvent, and keeping the desired, temp the desired temperature for 60 minutes. The solid residues were then washed and undergone anaerobic digestion. Click, please. Biomethane potential tests were carried out under mesophilic condition at 37 degrees using granular sludge as a source of microorganisms. Each bottle was filled with uh, inoculum and untreated or pretreated substrate with uh, a ratio of 1.5 in terms of graph of ES. Distilled water was added to get the final solid content of 2% total solid and to operate the bottle in wet condition. To ensure the anaerobic condition, the headspace was flushed with nitrogen gas. Next slide, please. So moving on to the experimental results. In this graph, we can see the methane production from methanol pretreated eczema skin with or without catalyst addition during the pretreatment. By comparing methane ears with the raw material in black, we can see how all pretreatment conditions were significantly effective on this substrate and how the efficiency increased with the temperature when no catalyst is used. Then, by comparing the two graphs, we can also see how the catalyst addition resulted in a plus 15% methane production comparing the optimal methane production with no compared to the optimal methane production with no catalyst. In addition, this was obtained with the lower temperature at under 30 degrees. The effectiveness, effectiveness of catalyst in low temperature pretreatment occurred because of the high temperature, because at high temperature, the lignocellulosic material release themselves acid that catalyze the pretreatment. Instead, at lower temperature, it is necessary to add it. Click, please. Here we also have some images too to, that support these results. These are referred to the most significant condition, which are raw material treatment at under 30 degree with no catalyst and treatment at under 30 degree with catalyst addition. Looking at this image, we can observe how the cellulose fibers appear amorphous index of the lignin removal from the substrate. Next slide, please. In conclusion, uh, what we can get from this study are uh, the following consideration. Methanol organosol pretreatment was particularly effective on heads and skin. Uh, also, the catalyst addition enabled to, ga to gain the higher methane production from heads and skin with the lowest pretreatment temperature. However, no significant effect of the pretreatment temperature was observed without catalyst addition. We also have some uh, idea to go on with this study. It would be, in fact, interesting to maximize and economically optimize the lignin recovery as well as to verify the economic viability of uh, recovery of valuable compound before undergoing pretreatment or AD. In fact, preliminary analysis show the night presence of extractives, mainly protein, phenolic compounds, and lipids in this substrate. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Armando. A, a very, very nice presentation. And that whole area of pretreatment is essential to expanding anaerobic digestion to a resource that will have effect on energy systems. Uh, our next presentation is from uh, Mohan Logan. Uh, he will present on the performance investigation of Internet of Things based anaerobic digestion. Uh, over to you, Lohan. Thank you very much, Professor Jerry Murphy. So. Uh, my, I'm going to present uh, now on performance investigation of Internet of Things based anaerobic digestion. Uh, I'm a PhD student under Professor Pete Lenz. Uh, to start with uh, base 4.0, uh, I have to start with uh, industry 4.0 or the fourth industrial revolution, which refers to the rapid digitalization or automation that is happening across different industries with the help of artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, cloud computing, etc. 
So Industry 4.0 is bound to revolutionize the waste management sector right from collection, transportation, treatment, and final disposal. There are many examples of waste 4.0. Some of them are waste, smart waste containers, vehicle tracking system for optimal routing, robotic recycling, monitoring the process parameters in waste treatment units, and even in landfills. Coming to waste to energy technology evolution, it started with open dumping, which got upgraded to direct incineration and then got upgraded to centralized biogas plants. But with a paradigm shift to decentralized anaerobic digestion systems and with the advent of Industry 4.0, the futuristic biogas plants might be operated as IoT based centrally monitored decentralized anaerobic digestion systems. Next slide, please. So the study aims to demonstrate uh, IoT based anaerobic digester that is biogas plant 4.0. In addition to that, uh, anaerobic digestion of food waste was evaluated at three different organic loading rates of one, two, and three kilogram volatile solids per meter cube per day. And the digester was operated at mesophilic temperature uh, under wet conditions, that is uh, with 10% total solids. The total volume of the digester was 1000 liters. However, the working volume was 675 liters. The feed that was used was food waste that was generated by the AIT community. It was segregated and grinded for particle size less than uh, 6 mm. And then uh, the process parameters that were monitored were pH, temperature, oxidation reduction potential, and the quality of the biogas that was produced. So you could see in the pilot digester that there are uh, three probes being embedded into the anaerobic digester. That is the pH, temperature, and ORP probes, which are in turn connected to the main server uh, with the help of programmable logic controller or PLC. And the real-time data can be accessed using Team viewer software. And at the same time, the biogas that was generated from the pilot scale digester has to pass through Ambison's online biogas analyzer. Again, the real time data can be accessed by logging on into Ambison's uh, company website. Next slide, please. So these are the results from the study. So uh, the biogas production throughout the experimental period is presented here and also the trend of the variation of pH and four stack is also presented. So before going into uh, the details, four stack refers to the ratio of total volatile fatty acids accumulation to total alkalinity. So if four stack is lower than 0.1, it means that the biological system is starving for food. Whereas if the four stack is more than 0.3, it means that the biological system is already overfed. So you could see here that at higher organic loading rates, there was decrease in pH and there was increase in four stack ratio. So which suggests that food waste anaerobic digestion poses process inhibition at higher organic loading rate due to acidification. Next slide, please. So the figure, uh, this figure depicts uh, IoT based centralized monitored or uh, decentralized anaerobic digestion systems. So the biogas plants 4.0 come up with several advantages. So they, they help us to generate real time data. They ease the operation and maintenance. They help us to make decisions and help us to make precautionary measures to be taken. For instance, when the pH falls below 6.8 or 6.5, then the plant operator out of the real time data that he gets, he can go to the uh, pilot scale anaerobic digester or the real anaerobic digester and take precautionary measures. For instance, he can add buffers such as sodium bicarbonate to improve the pH. So it helps us the IOT by employing IOT. It helps us to uh, to prevent the screwing up of the biological systems, which are very uh, difficult to recover because the recovery takes a long or uh, a, lo a longer retention time. So IOT helps us uh, to make uh, decisions and make precautionary measures. So it also helps us uh, to avoid complex analytical procedures that needs to be followed otherwise. For example, gas chromatography, which is not feasible uh, considering their cost and the time taken for analysis in community scale decentralized anaerobic digesters. Next slide, please. So finally, uh, the key takeaways are the paradigm shift to decentralized anaerobic digestion together with advent of industry 4.0 will lead future biogas plants to be installed and operated as centrally monitored community scale anaerobic digestion systems. The biogas plants 4.0 are associated with better management, operation and maintenance. In addition to that, AD of food waste at different organic loading rates was evaluated. You could see from this figure that at uh, with increase in organic loading rate, 
there was decrease in biogas and methane yield. At the same time, there was also decrease in volatile solids and total solid reduction. And importantly, it was found that food waste digestion poses process inhibition due to acidification at higher organic loading, with, which was evident from the pH drop and increase in four stack. And a novel four stack method was also validated for monitoring stability in anaerobic digestion systems because four stack was a very reliable, uh, simple titanometric method that uh, that helps us, that informs us about the stability of the digestion systems. And finally, if you want to know more details about this research study, you, you may uh, please refer to this uh, journal article which is published already in Process Safety and Environmental Protection. Thank you once again for your attention. Thank you very much, Mohan. Uh, an excellent presentation. And I have a few questions for you, which I might keep to the Q&A session. Um, okay. Our next presenter is Heyman Saad Rimaj, uh, and he is presenting on automatic control and artificial for anaerobic digesters, again, uh, in the research team of Pete Lawns. Uh, over to you, Payman. Um. Thank you very much, Professor Murphy, and thank you for joining this session. Uh, I'm going to try to make a case for the using artificial intelligence for automatic control of anaerobic digestion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so you may have the image of uh, an anaerobic digester as the one on the left, as interaction between different biochemical components but in pilot plants and then in full scale plants, there are more things going on. And one of these more things is a control system that you can see a schematic on the right. Next slide, please. Um, so when we say many different components, uh, we talk about um, mechanical, electrical, electronic, biological and chemical components. And these components form a nonlinear dynamic system as our anaerobic digester. Nonlinear dynamic means it has more than one steady state and more than one mode of behavior. Discontinuities in the behavior and finite escape times, also different initial conditions will result in different behaviors in the system. Next slide, please. So linear control design starts with uh, a mathematical description of the dynamic system we talked about. And then we should linearize this uh, dynamic system and solve, or uh, instead of linearizing it, solve it uh, with the numerical solutions. A controller tries to minimize the cost function, which is difference between the data from sensors, that is the state of our system, and desired state. So this difference is our cost function. What are the problems with this, uh, with this uh, way of approaching uh, control is that um, the solution for this system uh, is not guaranteed. Also, linearization and tests of the control on the actual system in the last stage of the design will introduce errors and then uh, this design process involves bias and judgment from the designer of the control. Next slide, please. Um, but so with these problems, why we go linear? Because it's easier for us and we know how to do uh, to how to deal with linear systems and we have good tools for dealing with linear systems and to design control systems. And it is also much cheaper to design and implement linear control systems. But um, not even this linear control is happening in practice. Uh, in practice, in many cases, there is a PID controller that uh, only the P term is tuned uh, and then uh, maybe the D term and the I term is not even touched. So nonlinear properties of uh, an anaerobic digester, which means changes in steady state and stability of the system, uh, means that with this PID, we get suboptimal conditions and not even best PLC programmers can adopt to changes in the plant so quickly and then um, because of this, we need an uh, experienced operator for the plant to tune the PID every time the, the state of the system changes or the behavior of the system changes. And next slide, please. So with uh, artificial intelligence um, or AI in short, can handle uh, two main parts of this 
control system. One is system identification that is making your, the nonlinear dynamic system, uh, making a model of that dynamical system. Uh, the other one is minimizing the cost function or acting as a controller. So your AI can uh, do the modeling of your system or do the, the job of your controller. Uh, in both of them, much better than uh, traditional control algorithms. We can see on the diagrams on the right that um, in traditional control design, we had data from nonlinear system and we try to design a good algorithm to achieve desired output. In AI control, we don't have to deal with the finding of the algorithm and solving the equations. We provide the input data and desired output for each input data. In other words, we provide examples uh, to our AI, and then this AI uh, produce the algorithm, which is our control. Uh, next slide, please. So in conclusion, mm, I say control is optimization constrained by dynamics, but machine learning and artificial intelligence is optimization based on data. So we don't have to deal with the dynamics and the complications of the dynamics. Machine learning is better in nonlinear optimization compared to the traditional control algorithms. Also, there are some aspects of anaerobic digestion that traditional control systems cannot deal with. By better control through AI, we, 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 have, we will have more stability and higher efficiency of AD, therefore, uh, higher economic feasibility and higher impact on reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Payman. A, a very interesting topic. Um, so we're into the, the coffee and discussion phase. I, I have maybe two or three questions I, I would like to start off with. And if Jan or Richie want to ask you with some of the more specific questions. Uh, for Mohan and Payman, the idea of um, the Internet of Things and AI is, is, is really very, very important looking forwards. Um, and I've seen some work on the idea of applying, for example, um, sensors on the land in terms of, of digested applications saying, look, the, the Morgan soil phosphorus here is too high. We can't accept digest state or the land is wet. And if a truck comes in, it causes poaching. But the idea of a central control across a catchment, including for the digesters, including for our slurry tanks, that the slurry tanks could send information saying, look, you know, I'm going to overflow if I'm not taken to the digester in the next week. So to both Mohan and Payman, do you see an overarching control system, maybe at province level, that could talk to different anaerobic digesters? that could look at land conditions, that could look at digestate management. Is this something that could happen in the next five or 10 years? Well, um, maybe I can just, but from my side of view is that um, optimizing the operation of individual plants or a group of plants can provide the data and also forecast for such a, such a management system that you mentioned on a larger scale, on a macro scale. Uh, and then on the macro scale, there can be decision making happening. And um, I know that also like, uh, at, because you mentioned catchment uh, base, um, it's already happening for hydrological and hydraulic uh, applications. So. Or I think it's quite uh, feasible to implement such a system. Uh, I, uh, uh, according to me, uh, that uh, I always uh, advocate for a large number of sensors and uh, a large uh, data that is being generated because having a lot of data is always good. It keeps us uh, informed and it helps us to make decisions. But there uh, there need to be drivers for uh, such a large uh, ambitious project. And uh, I, I, I see there are three challenges for this, that there are uh, financial uh, constraints can be an impediment. Then the lack of technical expertise of 
for handling these things can be a challenge and financial there and finally there can be also policy impediments to uh, uh, to encourage these things but i feel uh, that uh, there are more number of drivers that are focused towards anaerobic digestion enhancing methane or enhancing uh, hydrogen production but the the drivers that are uh, there to encourage sensors application in digestate management i think it is still very less now yeah. I, I i reviewed a report for the international energy agency and they spoke of the importance of internet of things uh, take an example of india in 20 years time loads of pd by day may be cold by night so your washing machine has to know the carbon intensity of electricity and turn itself off before you go on to coal like I would see great potential for anaerobic digesters across provinces looking at the electricity grid and at times where uh, the wind isn't blowing that we would store biogas in a bag but some sensor would tell the biogas go into the CHP unit now produce electricity because the wind isn't blowing and I, I would see potentially all digesters in a country connected to each other, both in terms of production of biogas, digest state, land application. And I think it's a great future. So I'm, I'm very impressed with your, your work topic, and I think it's got great potential. Some questions that were asked uh, by Ian O'Flynn, if I may go back to uh, Shun, uh, and just in general, the area of digest state application to land, its ability to be a biofertilizer, and the issues associated with um, antibiotic resistance. Uh, Sean, could you talk a little bit about whether it's good to spread digestate on land and to have a biofertilizer, or is there danger associated with, with uh, adding antimicrobial or, or antibiotic agents onto the land? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Yeah, we can hear okay, you. Um, exactly, I think uh, we we can test the uh, digested after AD, and we found also found um, the uh, antibiotic resistance in this digested. So I think you you have to make sure uh, or uh, keep the digest for longer time to reduce its. Uh, more efficiently and then you can spread on the um, uh, land as uh, a fertilizer. Um, nowadays, um, there are a lot of uh, researchers found that the spreading of uh, antigenesis on the lands can introduce the uh, antibiotic resistance to the water and to the some plants. And so I think maybe we need to uh, think about the best safety in the future and uh, try to find a more efficient way to treat this bare waste. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question was asked about explaining the addition of pyrochar to a digester and the mechanisms. I, 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 I suppose why we add pyrochar or graphene to an anaerobic digester is that it improves, it forms bridges between microbial agents. So rather than having hydrogen partial pressure, which is high inhibiting the process, by adding graphene or pyrochar, it allows the reactions to be far more favorable and to take place faster. A question that has been raised, and I might address it to Ben 10, relates to the logistics of adding graphene or pyrochar, the question is, is it a one-off dose? Is it a continuous dose? How do you get it back? So Ben 10, could you explain a little bit the logistics of addition of conductive material to an anaerobic digester? Thank you, Jerry. Uh, in terms of how can we, we, can we back the conductive materials? We think uh, it depends on how you die, how you, um, how you, uh, how to say, how how you uh, design your reactor. I mean, uh, you can use, for example, you can use uh, like a, a bag to hold your conductive materials in your digest. Then um, you can, uh, it's kind of like continuous one. Also, in for in the in our study, we just uh, uh, added the. Uh, 
conducting materials in digesters and uh, we didn't uh, concern about how to receive how to receive the conducting materials but in the future we think we can design the reactor like uh, hold it with a uh, with a bag to and then add the conducting materials inside so yeah again there is graphene is very expensive yeah pyrochar is not expensive yeah. So, I mean, if you put graphene into a reactor and it's spilling out, it, it becomes very, very expensive. But pyrochar can be very, very cheap, maybe a thousand times cheaper. What yeah. is the differentiation between adding a pyrochar as opposed to a graphene? Is, is, it, is it as good? Is it better? Is it not as good? Um, actually, I think based on, in my knowledge, I think it be, is based on what kind of feed stocks. Uh, you are treat you are treating. I mean, um, uh, one of my colleagues, Chen, has has found that uh, the application of pyrochar can enhance the digestion of seaweed significantly. But from my research for thin spinach, uh, the promotion effects of pyrochar um, wasn't significant. I mean, so I think it depends on the the feedstock. That's why we should study the application of pyrochar and graphene in different kinds of feedstocks to investigate their, their potential effects on biomethane production. So, yeah. Uh, a question to Leah, uh, and it relates to activated carbon absorbing long chain fatty acids. To me, and I, I've, I've read your work, Leah, and I'm very, very impressed. Like this could be a very innovative process with lots and lots of application. I mean, if you, if you look at Ireland, Oh, sorry, I'm on mute. Am I on mute? Uh, I can Maybe. actually hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Um, but if, if, if you look at addition of a material to a wastewater, and, and Ireland and many European countries have lots of agri-tech industries, like the application of what you're saying is, is very, very significant. I mean, you could remove the dissolved air flotation. Do you see potential problems with activated carbon addition to a wastewater, do you think it will work? Do you think that the activated carbon will be coated in long chain fatty acids? Or you might comment on the potential application of this technology to wastewater treatment plants across the planet. Uh, thank you very much, Jerry, for the question. So in, in, in effect, activated carbon itself is actually used in wastewater already as an absorbent. So it's a polishing step. Uh, so there's really not a far stretch on just adding the, the carbon itself in a reactor. So there are as as uh, Bengtan said already, that typically you would imagine a pack bed reactor, and there are hybrid pack beds where you have um, the NBV technology, where the top version is a pack bed and the bottom is a USB. So there's there's a huge potential instead of using an a uh, biofilm carrier, replace it with an activated carbon, and then you can both have biofilm generation and also um, enhance methane production. In in a sense that uh, also activated carbon, there's also a lot of spent activated carbon use for water treatment. So what about using those spent um, activated carbon and putting it in AD itself? There are also um, studies that saying that activated carbon itself is also self regenerating um, because there's organisms involved over time. I don't think saturation is an issue, although I mentioned it in a presentation that there could be saturation. We we think that um, bioregeneration would stop that saturation and still keeps on using both direct interspecies and absorption. And, and again, Leah, we're looking here at activated carbon. Do you see potential for pyrochars to replace the activated carbon? I mean, is diet a major element of what's happening or is it you, you want to have activated carbon in there? Um, I think both sides. Uh, biochar has its own benefits. Uh, it's more sustainable and also cheaper, but biochar itself is also made from a product and can release by leaching also other things like uh, trace elements or, or other toxic material if the substrate that uh, did pyrolysis had some metal uh, trace elements. The activated carbon, it's, um, it's pure carbon, so there could be benefits of no contamination, just pure carbon itself. So those benefits, we have to check which one would be offsetting. Uh, for me, I think biochar would be Pyrolysis and biochars would be a next step, assuming that the um, product itself is quite uh, is quite pure. Thank you very much, uh, Leah.
Um, I think our next topic is due to start. I, I think I've I think we've answered a lot of the questions. Um, so the next topic is biogas upgrading and digestive valorization. Uh, I'm just I might ask of Tara who's chairing this session. Will this be Jan or Richie or do you know at this moment, Tara? I think we have Jan online now. Jan, are you happy to chair this session? Yes, yes, I'm okay, here and, now. And, and I yeah. think um, due to the technical difficulties earlier, Jan is happy to give her own presentation first. Is that correct, Jan? Yeah, no problem. Okay, just bear with me and I will load your presentation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So Jan was due to present in session one on the life cycle assessment of pig manure and food waste management. Uh, we had a few technical difficulties. Jan wasn't able to join us. Jan was also going to chair session three and four. And now that we have Jan online, Jan might chair session four. But I will introduce Jan for her first presentation. Is that OK, Jan? OK, OK, thanks, thanks. So will I hand over to uh, Oh, here we go to Yan. Yan on the life cycle assessment of pig manure. Over to you, Yan. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, sorry, guys, for the technical uh, problems in this morning. I'm always on, but uh, I cannot join as a presenter. And uh, now I uh, move my presentation here. So uh, today I will introduce the life cycle assessment of pig manure and. Yeah, and you're on mute. Can you unmute? Oh, yeah? Okay, okay, okay. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Sorry, sorry for my mistake. And uh, sorry, guys. I had some technical problems uh, this morning, and uh, now I come back. Uh, I will introduce the LCA of food waste and pig manure treatment methods. So in our study, uh, I will assess. You're gone mute again, Yeah, and you might unmute. Is it OK now? I didn't click anything, but it turned mute automatically. OK, yeah, I hear you now, Jan. Keep going. OK, OK. And uh, so in this study, uh, we will assess the life cycle assessment. Uh, we, we will uh, assess the environmental impacts of present pig manure and the food waste treatment method in Ireland and to compare with co-digestion of them. So the first question is why we study co-digestion of food waste and pig manure? According to our previous study, we found monodigestion of pig manure is not financially viable at various pig farm sites, that is. But when co-digesting with food waste, it becomes economically viable. And we can find from this figure uh, the payback period is uh, six years and uh, 10 years for different pig farms and the different food waste uh, amounts. In today's study, we defined a function unit based on the annual pig, uh, the annual pig meal production from an average pig farm size of 762 stoves. And uh, uh, presently in Ireland, food waste is mainly treated by composting with only 22% sent for anaerobic digestion. So the average uh, anaerobic digestion facilities accepted 10,000 tons of food waste per year. As a result, we use 16,000 tons per year pig manure and 10,000 tons of food waste uh, per year to do the analysis. Next slide, please. So we can find that there are two scenarios in this study. The first one, the baseline, is for current pig manure and food waste treatment method, where pig manure is directly land applied and food waste is sent for composting and AD according to uh, the proportions mentioned above. And in the co-AD scenario, all these substrates are co-digested. The following table shows the uh, Overall environmental impacts of this study, uh, 11 environmental categories are assessed. From the result, the negative value means this scenario caused environmental beneficial 
and the uh, positive value indicates environmental impacts. The last column indicates the changes of co-AD scenario compared with the baseline. We can find in none of the 11 categories assessed, co-AD scenario performs much better, much better than baseline. Uh, it decreased the environmental impact by over 100% to over 1700%, except for acidification and the eutrophication potentials. If we go to next one, please. Then we did the hotspot analysis for several key categories for global warm potential and fossil fuel depletion. Uh, even though the net impacts of the co-AD scenario are much higher than baseline, uh, but the much higher bare gas credit can compensate this impact greatly. And uh, at last, it results in a um, beneficial, beneficial result. And for these two categories, the anaerobic digestion process, digested storage process are the main contributors. And for acidification and eutrophication, uh, the ammonia emissions during the land uh, uh, spreading are the main contributors. So it tells us uh, by properly operation of the anaerobic digestion, digestive storage and the land spreading, we have the potential to uh, increase the impacts greatly. Next one, please. During co-digestion, the food waste proportion is an important parameter to affect the result, especially the specific methane yield and the VS removals. These two parameters determine the bare gas credit and uh, mm, fertilizer credits during the environmental uh, impact assessment. So a modified variable model is proposed to simulate the specific methane yield and VS removal at different food waste uh, proportions um, based on the previous experimental data. Uh, the effect of the food waste proportions on the environmental impacts are shown on the right. We can find the global warming potential and the fossil fuel depletion decreased greatly with the increase of food waste because of the higher bare gas produced. And only when the food waste uh, amount is over 6,000 times per year, the global warming potential becomes beneficial. And uh, the acidification and the eutrophication potential increased with the food waste proportion because of the uh, much more produced uh, digested. And the uh, next one, please. So as a, as a summary, uh, the co-AD uh, scenario performed much better in most of the environmental categories assessed, except for acidification and eutrophication. But the much higher bare gas credit uh, in the co-AD scenarios can compensate the impact greatly, especially for global warming potential and fossil fuel depletion. Uh, only when the food waste proportion is over 6,000 times per year, the global warming potential becomes beneficial. Okay, that's my report, thanks. Thank you very much, Yang. Okay. I, I'm and, now gonna hand over to you and you can yeah. share the next session. So I, I'm gonna mute myself now. Thank you, Yang. Okay, thank you so much and uh, uh, Thank you guys and uh, because of the technical problems I didn't join in this morning but uh, I just uh, joined as an attendee. So uh, now I'd like to um, welcome everyone to topic four. Uh, the next presenter I'd like to introduce is uh, Archishman Both. Can you Archishman the uh, profile please? Yeah. I think Archie Sman is a PhD student in UCC in Jared's group, and uh, today he will present the cascading algo uh, vermethane bar refinery system. Now let's welcome uh, Archie Sman. Thanks a lot, Jan. Um, can you hear me well? Uh, if you can just give the heads up. Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Um, Tara, if you can give my first slide, please. Thank you. So um, I'll be briefly taking you through the cascading algal biomethane biorefinery systems. 
that we uh, have given a, a, a um, acronym of CABS, and I'll talk you through the experiments and the system modeling that we are doing. Um, so what is our CABS that we fondly call CABS? So you will find a very detailed uh, uh, idea of CABS that we have uh, published and uh, in our recent paper, but it's act, uh, in a very brief, it's a circular bioeconomy system where we integrate algae or microalgae more specifically in every aspect of anaerobic digestion, um, including biogas production, possibly uh, digestive treatment and biogas upgrading. And in the end, use the microalgae in a biorefinery to produce food, feed, and energy. So the CABS is basically a AD system with additional products of food, feed, and energy while producing biomethane for transporting sector. So is it possible to produce uh, carbon, also do carbon capture? Because the algae is here indeed taking up carbon. And we can say if we choose uh, rightly, our food, feed, or energy pathway, we can get a bioenergy with carbon capture and storage. But for our experiment, we focus on photosynthetic biogas upgrading, which we will see in the next slide in more details. So photosynthetic biogas upgrading is basically take using algae to upgrade biogas. And how this works is it starts with a bubble column. In the bubble column, we bubble the biogas in. The algae solution is an alkaline solution, so the algae, so the carbon dioxide goes in as bicarbonate, uh, and then the bicarbonate is food for the algae. And when the algae takes up the bicarbonate, it produces uh, carbonate back, and we can continue doing in a cycle. Once we have the algae, we can harvest it and then produce chemicals. All the system design and technical challenges and per, uh, backgrounds are discussed in the paper that I have highlighted here. And down below, we, you can see our lab setup. That's an in-house lab setup we have developed to uh, do experiments on this. And just to let you know that our algae is spirulina platensis, which we found out based on number of criteria as the most suitable species for biogas upgrading. So if we look in our next slide for our algae cultivation system, so we, we did batch cultivations in five liter flasks. And what we found out as the takeaway is we did the experiments at 20 degrees. Uh, algae uh, spirulina grows well at 30 degrees, but uh, we did our based on our lab uh, facilities available. We did at 20 degrees and found it uh, a maximum concentration of 1.65 grams per liter after 15 days and the carbon fixation efficiency which defines how much carbon the algae takes up of the total carbon that's available in solution. It comes around 34%, which is not bad, but which is not high uh, either. So we have validated our algae cultivation system with literature, and the next slide will present how we validate our biogas upgrading column. So what we did, our uh, so it's a lab scale setup, and our column diameter was 2.4 centimeters, um, and we varied the different liquid and gaseous flow rates. We varied the algae concentration and studied the effect of light. So the effect of light basically signified the photosynthetic activity of the algae. So when there is light, algae is taking up carbon dioxide and giving up oxygen. And when there is no light, the system reverses. So what we see by varying the liquid and gaseous flow rates, so we punch it together and give it a name L by G. L stands for liquid, gas stands for gas, gas flow. So the L by G ratio, when we increase the liquid flow rate relative to the gas flow rate, after, after one point of time, we get a biomethane, which is suitable for gas grid injection based on the CO2 limits. The CO2 limits are 2.5% in the gas for biogas grid injection. So we get that and we do not see a large difference, a significant difference between uh, the presence and absence of algae. Um, but our main problem starts with the oxygen stripping because the, in the solution there is oxygen. And the, even though a presence of algae increases the oxygen stripping, uh, which is supported by theory that there is better mixing and be so better removal, um, so, but in any case, it is always higher than the permissible of 1%. So we cannot have one more than 1% oxygen in our biomethane. 
However, what we see here is that the minimum we achieve with no almost very little algae is 3%. And this is a major challenge uh, that we need to overcome in our, in our further experiments. However, what we have established in our experiments so far is that the bubble column is matching other literature values. So our setup has been uh, uh, our setup has been validated, and uh, the scale up has also been discussed. That the scale up can be it, it, the, this setup is scalable up to one centimeter per second. So at that at this moment, our setup is scalable but not completely scalable. Um, so this is the very first uh, step of validation. And in the final uh, slide, what I would like to say is what my future work that currently is facing some difficulties due to all shutdowns and I guess everyone is facing this difficulty. So once things get normalized, I would like to look into uh, the bubble column optimization that is to maximize the CO2 removal while minimize the oxygen stripping and also integrate it with the algae cultivation. So as you have seen, we have two separate systems. I would now like to integrate the two and finally do a detailed modeling of GABS. So the system that I showed you at the very beginning is just how it is on a very broad context. But when we go into the detailed modeling, it will increase a number of steps, sub steps. So I, we would like to do some techno-economic and life cycle assessment to see if how the biomethane from CAP system is really, really matching up with the recommendations of uh, uh, re, uh, renewable energy directives, directives and other international directives, as you have heard before. So that's all I have to share for this. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk. Thanks for the nice presentation of Ashishman. And Ashishman introduces the application of LG during the biomethane refinery. And our next speaker is Yuan Shenghu. Yuan Shenghu is a postdoctoral researcher from NUI Galway, and he will also introduce uh, he will introduce the macroalgae uh, during the uh, carbon dioxide sequestration, uh, water uh, wastewater purification, <coughs> and the biofuel production. Now, welcome Yuan Sheng. Uh, thank you Yuan, for your introduction. Um, and Amal, yeah, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, I okay. can hear. Uh, hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Jensen from Professor Siemens Group at NUI Galway. I'm very happy to here today to present our recent results on outer floating microalgae for CO2 capture, wastewater purification, and the biofuels production. Next, please. So, first of all, some background on microalgae biofuels. Um, microalgae bio uh, have attracted intensive attention as uh, advantages uh, by fields of stock. The advantages of microalgae include high productivity, non-competition with arable land, and the co-production of value-added byproduct. Uh, especially its cultivation can be coupled with wastewater treatment and uh, CO2 capture, thus achieving significant uh, environmental benefit. Uh, despite its great potential, however, Industrial uh, implementation of uh, microalgae by fuel uh, is still not viable due to several challenges such as uh, cultural contamination, nutrient and CO2 supply, and uh, particularly the high economic and uh, energy, uh, energetic cost associated with harvesting and dewatering of microalgae by mice. So just to look at the um, figures, uh, the values uh, as a uh, left corner. So the cost of to harvesting um, one kilogram biomass, uh, uh, biomass in open culture um, systems is, is uh, uh, around uh, uh, 0 0.5 to 2 euros per kilo. And the energy is uh, 2.2, uh, 0 0.2 to 5 kilowatt um, per kilo biomass. <clears throat> so as you can see, this high cost uh, makes my agar by fields are still not economically viable. Um, to overcome these issues, we have uh, recently developed a novel technology to select and to cultivate outer floating microalgae in open culture conditions, as shown in the um, pictures uh, on the uh, right side. So the outer floating microalgae can effectively float at the water surface without the need for flocculant and the flotation gas. 
thus achieving cost-effective harvesting. In addition, the microalgae also have excellent dewaterability, can be dewatered to a solid content of 22% by direct microfiltration in less than five minutes. So overall, um, outflowing and microalgae can potentially overcome the harvesting and dewatering problems in algae biofilms production. Next, please. To explore its biofuel potential, we firstly investigate its, its biodiesel production potential when grow in secondary wastewater effluent. <coughs> the outfloating microalgae grow very really well in secondary wastewater effluent, reaching a high biomass concentration around 5 gram per liter in two weeks, uh, as shown in the uh, left top figure. It's also attained a high biodiesel yield up to 27% of GICL weight. And the major zero composition was 53% of carbohydrate, 34% of total lipids, and a small portion of protein, uh, as shown in the figure uh, in the left bottom. Uh, most interestingly, around 60% of the carbohydrate were beta glucans, which have high uh, medicinal value due to its significant biological activities, such as uh, Antioxidation, antibacterial, antivirus, anti tumors, etc. So, correspondingly, this provides a great opportunity to co produce biofilms and high value bioproducts in our bio refinery approach. Next, please. So, next, we investigate the feasibility to cope its cultivation with uh, an anaerobic digestion for biofilms production. First, we investigate its growth and the different CO2 concentrations and found its growth best in 5% CO2, which is the typical CO2 concentration in biogas GHP uh, exhaust. Then, we investigate the effect of digestive loading and found its growth best uh, can grow very well in diluted digestate, although high digestive loading showed inhibition. <coughs> And the suitable digestive loading rates and the microalgae attained high by this year. Meanwhile, it's also achieved efficient nutrient removal from digestate. Next, please. We also investigate its biomedicine production potential in mono digestion condition and co digestion with pig pigmanure, as varying algae to pigmanure ratios. So the results show co-digestion of uh, microalgae and pigmanu can significantly enhance the missing yield up to uh, 27%. Meanwhile, it also improves the digestion kinetics as indicated by the much higher hydrolysis rates and much lower lactane. Most interestingly, outfloating microalgae can significantly improve the digestive dewaterability especially at higher algae ratios, thus facilitating digestive management. So just look at the uh, algae ratio uh, as 80%, A0.8. <coughs> so the uh, SRF value uh, meets the direct uh, dewatering, mechanical dewatering requirement. I mean, without um, conditioning, um, that this is below four, um, tens, uh, 10 tens to uh, 12 uh, powers uh, meter per kilogram. <clears throat> Next, please. So, to conclude, <clears throat> outfloating microalgae can potentially overcome the harvesting and dewatering problems in algae biofilms production. Outfloating microalgae have very high biodiesel and biomedicine production potential. And thirdly, out of floating microalgae provides a great opportunity for integral CO2 capture, wastewater purification, and biofilms pro production. So the figure below shows uh, our idea of uh, uh, integrate um, biofilms production, digestive purification, and CO2 saturation with uh, this microalgae, um, supported by the SEI fund. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Anshan, for the presentation. And our next uh, presenter is Jewel Des, 
Uh, he is a PhD student in AOIG, and uh, his topic is on biogas upgrading for grade injection. Welcome, Zhu. Thanks. So, chair of this session and dear audience, hello. So, it's a privilege to share our research carried out at NUI Gole under supervision of Professor Bitlands. I would like to acknowledge the Symposium Organizing Committee for giving the opportunity. My PhD topic is about biogas cleanup for direct grid injection. Next slide, please. We know wastes such as livestock manure, agricultural residues, are a rich source of organic matter for biogas production. Biogas produced through anaerobic digestion has both economic benefits, for example, heat, electricity, and fuel generation, and environmental benefits such as waste management. However, the presence of other gases, excluding methane in raw biogas, are considered as biogas impurities. For example, corrosive nature of hydrogen sulfide makes biogas unsuitable for direct application. Next, please. Here, I wish to highlight a novel bioreactor configuration and its application for gas phase hydrogen sulfide removal. The left photograph in the slide demonstrates the schematic of the bioreactor configuration. To fabricate the bioreactor and continue its operation, a microfiltration hollow fiber membrane module was immersed in the liquid microbial suspension. Then, gas phase hydrogen sulfide was passed through the inner side of the hollow fiber. It is hypothesized that the presence of a membrane module can contribute on rapid diffusion of hydrogen sulfide into the liquid phase. Moreover, this bioreactor configuration could have the combined effects of microbial attached growth. That means the biofilm formation on the outer membrane surface and suspended growth in the liquid phase. You can see the experimental setup, which is has shown in the right photographs. Three reactors are fabricated, where two reactors are used for a biotic process and one for a biotic process. Next slide, please. So here are the, some results I have shown. We tested the effect of inoculum and inlet loading rate. The figures represent the hydrogen sulfide removal performance, the left figure for bioreactor one and right figure for bioreactor two. The reactors are operated for nearly three months where inlet hydrogen sulfide concentration was applied up to 650 ppm. The bioreactors achieved nearly 99% removal efficiency with an elimination capacity of nearly 18 gram per cubic meter per hour for an empty bat residence time, that means the gas contact time of nearly three minutes. Next slide, please. So to compare the biotic and abiotic process, the hydrogen sulfide flux through the hollow fiber membrane module and the overall mass transfer coefficient were determined for both bioreactors and a biotic reactor. Hydrogen sulfide flux of the bioreactor was nearly nine times higher, and overall mass transfer coefficient was nearly 25 times higher than a biotic reactor. Microbial community analysis confirmed the presence of sulfur oxidizing bacteria genera in the bioreactor. You can see in the left corner some microbial species in genus level. We also noticed biofilm formation on outer surface of the membrane. You can see the bottom mm, three SEM images which depict different microbial colonies on the membrane surface. Next, please. So to conclude, the hollow fiber membrane based bioreactor achieved nearly 99% removal efficiency for an inlet hydrogen sulfide loading rate of 18 gram per cubic meter per hour at an empty bed residence time of 187 seconds. The bioreactor demonstrated efficient gas liquid mass transfer and hydrogen sulfide flask. Experiments are being carried out to optimize and evaluate the reactor performance for long-term operation. For example, 
to know the maximum hydrogen sulfide elimination capacity, effect of different empty bed residence time on removal performance, and the resilience capacity of the reactor during shock loads. So thank you for your kind attention. Thanks, Jun. Uh, thanks, Jun, for the presentation. And uh, he used uh, a membrane for bare gas cleaning up. And uh, our next speaker also used membrane technology, uh, but this time it's for VFV recovery from digestage. And uh, now let's welcome uh, ha Harish uh, Ravish Hankar, <laughs> sorry, a postdoctoral researcher from NUI Galway. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Uh First slide, please. Yeah. Uh, so today I'm going to discuss about uh, application of membrane process for VFA recovery from dial states. I work with Professor Lenz and uh, next slide, please. So why VFA is volatile fatty acids? So volatile fatty acids are short chain fatty acids and they are important platform chemicals with high commercial importance. Traditionally, they are prepared by uh, non renewable uh, petrochemical sources. Uh, therefore, uh, Looking for alternative means would be a good way to go about. In this case, bio-based production through fermentation and microbial electrosynthesis can assist in partial replacement of VFA production. Uh, with the EU's long-term goal of uh, achieving low carbon economy by 2050, uh, working on bio-based uh, approaches would be a good way to go about. And the major bottleneck with regard to uh, uh, separation of VFAs and recovery from these digestates uh, is a major concern uh, due to the low co concentration of the VFAs as well as the complex physical chemical nature of the digestate that is present. Uh, next slide, please. <coughs> oh, so there are different technologies that are being used for separation of VFAs and uh, uh, there are a few of them have been listed here and uh, our focus is on membrane processes. So if you're going to look at membrane processes, it can be broadly classified into two major uh, streams, either it is pressure driven or non-pressure driven. Uh, in the case of pressure driven process, you have a, a semi permeable membrane, such as in reverse osmosis or a nanofiltration membrane, and you apply a pressure on one side and the water uh, would pass through the membrane and it would reject the ions or other contaminants that are present. And this pressure driven process does require some energy input to it. Whereas in the in the case of non pressure driven process such as uh, vapor permeation membrane contactor, it is a separation system where uh, gas liquid comes in contact with each other that promote mass transfer between the two phases across the membrane without dispersion of each other. Uh, next please. Next, please. So over here, what we try to do is we are trying to utilize this concept in uh, separating VFAs from uh, mixed solution. So we in an NUIG incorporated this idea and we uh, got the silicon membrane contactor schematic and uh, we worked on this particular setup and we got few results. So in this particular setup, what we have here is we have uh, the feed side and the draw side. And in the feed side, you have the, the VFA containing mixture, whereas in the draw side, you have an extractant. And uh, in this case, a draw solution is going to be your DA water. So what we do here is we have the silicon membrane uh, that is coiled and immersed inside the DA water, which is a draw solution. Uh, we use a peristaltic pump to pump the, uh, the solution from the feed side uh, into the draw side. And uh, due to the concentration gradient that is present, uh, across the membrane with the feed solution and the draw solution, the VFAs they move across the membrane onto the draw solution. And based on this, uh, we we based on this concept, we performed a lot of experiments. Uh, next slide, please. So so for our experiments, what we did was we chose uh, two model solution. One was synthetic VFA mixture, another was real cheese whey digestate. Next, next please, yeah. Uh, uh, we, we looked at different parameters uh, uh, before running these experiments. The first was to look at the pH. Uh, uh, so we used two different pH, pH 3 and pH 5. Generally, in the case of anaerobic digestion, uh, uh, pH 5 was preferred and they normally run at pH 5. And our aim was to integrate uh, the silicon membrane contactor to the anaerobic digestion. Uh, 
at pH 5, around 60% of your VFAs are in undissociated form, whereas in the case of pH 3, you have around 99% of VFAs which are in undissociated form. So we also wanted to see how this undissociation and dissociated VFA can affect the, uh, the mass transfer or the flux of uh, uh, for, for the separation. And then we looked at using uh, the temperature as well. So the effect of temperature on the parameters. Uh, the concentration of VFAs in the draw solution was monitored uh, for all the experiments. And, and from the values, we calculated the flux, the mass transfer coefficient, and also the overall recovery of VFAs from the from the feed side to the draw side. Next slide, please. So over here, what we have done is uh, we, we are just presenting the results for one particular condition for, for at pH 3 and temperature 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, the results were quite similar uh, for the other conditions as well. And this graph uh, uh, gives you the concentration of VFA in the draw solution. Uh, the draw solution in this case is a synthetic VFA mixture, so we used five different uh, VFAs mixed in the solution. And uh, what we observed here is that uh, the VFA concentration in the draw solution, that is a DA water, increased over the period of time. Uh, uh, one exception being caproic acid, which started to decrease after 26 hours. And this was attributed to the low solubility of caproic acid uh, in the presence of other VFAs uh, in the water. Next, please. So this was for the model solution cheese whey digestate, and the cheese whey digestate predominantly had acetic and butyric acid, and uh, uh, the concentration of them in the draw solution uh, is, is can be seen in this graph, and uh, we can see that the butyric acid uh, uh, concentration increased over the period of time, and acetic acid to an extent. Uh, the major reason being uh, the butyric acid presence in the cheese whey digestate was higher than the acetic acid. Next, please. So based on these results, we calculated the flux of VFAs and uh, what we observed was that uh, with increase in temperature for synthetic VFA mixture as a model solution, the flux uh, uh, decreased, uh, slightly decreased for acetic and propionic acid and uh, a considerable decrease can be seen for butyric, valeric and caproic acid. Uh, with regard to the cheese whey digestate, butyric acid had a better flux. Uh, than acetic acid because of the concentration uh, of butyric in the cheese whey digestate uh, as the concentration gradient was a major driving force. Next, please. And uh, uh, this rapid diffusion of caproic acid can be utilized for uh, selective separation of caproic acid from mixture of VFA. So we could exploit this uh, uh, to separate the caproic acid if you have a mixture of VFA in the solution. Next slide, please. Next, please. Yeah. And uh, once again, with the results, we calculated the mass transfer coefficient. And what we observed here was uh, the longer the carbon chain, uh, the, the higher the mass transfer was found. Uh, so you can see the caproic acid had a higher mass transfer coefficient for all conditions uh, when compared to valdric, butyric, and propionic, propionic and acetic acid. And uh, with regard to cheese whey solution, or cheese whey digestate, what we observed was that uh, butyric acid had a higher mass transfer coefficient compared to acetic acid. And once again, this is due to the presence of more butyric acid in the solution compared to acetic acid. Next, please. And the recovery of uh, the volatile fatty acids was also calculated for uh, uh, the model solution as well as well as the cheese whey digestate. Uh, what we observed here was that uh, the recovery percentage decreased with increase in temperature. This uh, uh, corroborated well with the flux values that was observed earlier as well. And uh, uh, to mention here, the, the recovery percentage was calculated based on the 50% that could be obtained in the draw solution because the concentration gradient was a driving force. So at the max, you can only get 50% of the, uh, the VFA in the uh, extractant or the draw solution uh, when compared to the, uh, the feed solution. Uh, next, please. Uh, this was a recovery graph that was uh, obtained for cheese whey digestate and in general, the butyric acid showed a higher recovery compared to acetic acid, and there was a slight increase in uh, uh, recovery for both the acids at 40 degrees Celsius. Uh, next, please. Uh, so the overall mass transfer coefficient of VFAs followed uh, the trend, and uh, butyric acid showed a higher recovery than acetic acid. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, a maximum of 90 and 83 percent of valeric and caproic acid was ob obtained uh, from synthetic solution. And obviously the recovery from cheese whey digestate was comparatively lower with 14 and 43 percent 
uh, recovery of acetic and butyric acid. Uh, uh, and the present system can be applied for inline separation of VFAs from real type state with, with selectivity for longer chain fatty acids. Uh, thank you. Thanks for the nice presentation. And uh, our next uh, uh, presenter works on the digested volatilization and is uh, XD Zhong Meng, a PhD student from NYG, and he will report the recovery of, of ammonia from digested. Welcome, Xi Zhong. Thanks, Ian. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, hello, everyone. Yeah, we can hear you. Oh, thanks. Hello, everyone. Very glad to give a representation. My name is Ji Zhong Meng from NUI Galway Siemens Group. My presentation title is Recovery of Ammonium from Digested Municipal Sludge Centric. Next slide, please. Mm, uh, active sludge process is widely used all over the world. The excess sludge is the main byproduct. Usually, the excess, sl excess sludge was treated by an uh, anaerobic digestion. After the digestion, the digester is usually further be treated by, uh, by centrifuging and uh, products the centrate. The centrate is rich in nutrients. We collect the centrate from a local vegetable treatment plant. The total nitrogen is about 1000 mg per liter. Most of them is ammonium, which is reached up to 950 mg per liter. But the phosphorus is below 10 below to 10 milligram per liter. The phosphate is about 2.8 milligram. Also, the centrate it contains lots of organic matters. The COD is about 9, uh, 960 milligram per liter, and TS is around 20 gram per liter. So the centrate is rich in ammonium. Usually, the centrate will be pumped back to the plant for treatment. It will increase about 15 to 20 percent of burden of the new uh, ammonium treatment. Next slide, please. So, so can we uh, can the uh, can the ammonium be recovered as a nutrient by electrodialysis? The electrodialysis is a promising technology for nutrient recovery. It's an efficient membrane best best technology compared to other uh, membrane-based technology like uh, the membrane filtration and reverse osmosis. The three aspects we focused, uh, focused are the feasibility, efficiency, and the membrane folding. The first feasibility is can we only recover the cuttings, you know, it's ammonium, without the anions recovery. The second is the efficiency. You know, electrodialysis is electro-based technology. The efficiency will determine this application. The third is the membrane folding. Mm, you know, membrane folding is a very serious problem during e uh, electrodialysis, not like the, the application in product uh, industry. When electrodialysis applied applicates in waste water treatment, the organic matter in waste uh, in water will cause the serious folding, so you will not recover the onions. Can, will the membrane folding be mitigated? So next next slide, please. yeah. This is the ED uh, structure. The left is a single unit, and the right is the repeating unit. Uh, under the electro power applied, the ele electro files generated under by the forcing driving, the cuttings will transfer through the cutting exchange member and move towards to the castle and the blocked by the anions exchange member because we don't want to recover the phosphates. So just two uh, cutting, cuttings exchange member and the one anion exchange member used in one unit, in per unit. Next slide, please. This is the result. From the results, can see that more than 90% ammonium recovered in both single and repeating units. The product concentration is, 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 can be, uh, 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 the concentration ratio can be more than five times and, and the concentration is higher than 7,000 milligrams in the ammonium. 
and it can be more higher. Uh, the membrane folding was mitigated. We can see from the picture, the aligned membrane used in, in this study is more clean than the conventional, conventional uh, electrodynamic assays used. So the, uh, the, ex the experiment is not finished not, uh, yet, so more results in detail will get in the future. So from the results, we can uh, we can know that the electrodiagnosis can work efficiently to recover the ammonium with high concentration and uh, mitigate mitigate the membrane folding. The next slide. Thanks. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, Ji Zhong, for the nice presentation. And uh, our last uh, presenter in talk four is Lin Shi. Uh, she's a uh, he's a research fellow from uh, TCD. He will report the antibiotics removal during nutrient uh, nutrient recovery from pig manure digested using electrodiastasis technology. Welcome, Lee. Okay, thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm Lin Shi, and now I'm postdoctoral researcher uh, working in the Trinity College Dublin. Today, I would like to talk something about the in situ anodic oxidation electrodiagnosis for the antibiotics removal during a process of nutrient recovery from the pig manure digested. Oh, next, please. Uh, in our previous study, we have already demonstrated that it's uh, feasible to use the electrodiagnosis technology to re recover the nutrients from the pig manure digested. Particularly for the electrodiagnosis re reversal technology, it can frequently reverse the electrode, uh, uh, so it can it, it can prevent the particle folding in the system. So it can be fe feasible to use for long-term operation. Uh, here I listed uh, uh, some previous publications related to the electrodiagnosis uh, for your reference. Uh, for the peak manure digested, we can we firstly process with a solid liquid separation to re to remove the solid part, and for the liquid part, we use the electrodialysis technologies to concentrate the uh, and concentrate the uh, uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, and then we can harvest the product. But in this, the problem is that in this process, the antibiotics can be also transported and concentrated into the product, and causing a potential risk to the environment. So. Uh, my uh, my research is wish to uh, remove the antibiotics in this process. Next, please. Next page, please. Uh, on the left of the screen, you can see the basic, uh, very basic, uh, basic uh, configuration of the electrodiagnosis. It contains uh, one pair of the electrode and uh, some chitin and iron membranes collapsed between the two electrodes. So in the membrane section, the the ions and chitons can be separated and concentrated into from from the feed solution into the product solution. Uh, uh, but uh, for the but but we know the anode and cathode can also produce oxygen and hydrogen. But this part of the energy are normally are normally ignored and wasted. Uh, so in my process, I wish to use this the, this surplus energy on the anode and cathode to eliminate eliminate the antibiotics in the ED system. So on the in the middle of the screen, we can see I set up a, a electrolysis reactor. It contain, contains only one pair of the electrodes. So the the antibiotics in this in this system can be oxidized into smaller molecules. So uh, first day I investigate uh, what it would happen in this reactor. And then after that, I integrate integrate it into the ED into the electrodialysis membrane section. I pump the feed solution into the anode chamber first to oxidize the uh, antibiotics and then it flow, the, the feed solution flowed into the membrane section for the nutrient recovery process. Then I selected uh, uh, the subsidizing and tetracycline as two target uh, antibiotics because they are very common used, uh, commonly used in the, pig, uh, in the animal farms. So next slide please. So on the left of the screen, we can see in the single compartment reactor, the electrolysis, it only contains one pair of the elect uh, electrodes. There is no significant influence on the nutrient recovery 
uh, but the antibiotics can be efficiently removed in this process. And then we all also check the intermediates. We find that the intermediates all uh, organized into very small uh, organic uh, organic molecules at last. And uh, after we integrate the anode, the, the, uh, the anode into the ED to, to the electrodialysis reactor, we find it's also very efficient to remove the two uh, antibiotics in the system. So next slide, please. So we, uh, it's very important to uh, to check the memory folding in this system because the anode can uh, can produce some gas bubbles, uh, so it can increase the liquid turbulence turbulence in this system. So it can significantly prevent the particle folding in this in this system. In this system, it's, which is uh, favorable for the operation of the electrodialysis. And we also check the. Uh, uh, the variation of the organic dissolved organic organic matter using the UV absorbance wavelength uh, absorbance at the 254 wavelengths, we find that uh, the the dissolved concentration of the organic matter decreases, and we check the uh, EEM uh, check the conversation of the uh, dissolved organic matter. We find two peaks that are the proteins and humic acids, but protein was organized and vanished. But the humic mass, uh, humic acid uh, uh, became weaker. Uh, so next, please. Uh, it's very important to uh, to determine the concentration of the disinfection byproducts in this process because we don't uh, don't want too much of the uh, disinfection byproducts produced. And uh, it's very good that it, uh, that there was a very low concentration of the. Uh, this infection byproducts produced uh, compared with the conventional electrolysis uh, uh, reactor. So the reason of causing this problem may be the membrane separation and the uh, membrane sorption. So uh, th uh, this is a very important finding in my system. Uh, so uh, so in addition, in addition to the energy saving, we have uh, this anode ED system can uh, have no significant uh, influence on the nutrient recovery. It can uh, we can get a very efficient removal of antibiotics, and the membrane folding can uh, can be prevented, and uh, uh, it can also generate a very low concentration of the disinfection byproducts. Uh, so this water can be potentially used for the on-farm flushing of the manure. Oh, okay, that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Lee, for the presentation. And uh, uh, now we will go to our question and answer part. We have a lot of questions and uh, some of them the presenter have answered in the Q&A box. And uh, uh, still we found a lot of people are very interested in the um, industry application of uh, our technologies. And uh, here I'd like to uh, read several que uh, two questions for Joe Des and uh, Des, uh, Joe, can you uh, open your microphone? And um, the the first one is, uh, how does your uh, hollow fiber membrane compare to exi existing purification technologies? And uh, what do you see new cheaper technologies enter into widespread use to produce uh, network uh, grid bare Thank you. So. It's actually a very good question. So in response to this question, we know that for biogas purification process, mainly deal with the physical chemical methods, for example, water scrubbing, which nearly 42% share of the total uh, separation methods, followed by the chemical scrubbing, pressure swing, adsorption, and membrane separation. However, we know the limitations of physical chemical methods for related to cause, and chemicals and environment. So main advantage of biological methods are its sustainability and simple operation techniques, low cost, and it's also environment friendly. In past, man, membrane technology mainly used for the physical separation, but here we are trying to introduce it as a, a combined effect, the biological approach. So here we wanted to establish the Hydrogen sulfide will dissolve, diffuse through the membrane and it will uh, dissociate into the liquid phase. Then microbes will consume the hydrogen sulfide 
and then we can remove the bio uh, purify the biogas in this way. So so far we have done the first phase, and now we are trying to optimize to check whether there is fouling and how it can affect the affect the bioreactor performance for hydrogen sulfide removal, etc. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And the second question is uh, uh, it's about the removal of uh, hydrogen sulfide. And uh, uh, someone is very interested in the typical, uh, typical concentration of hydrogen yeah. sulfide in uh, bare gas yeah. and uh, what will happen during the removal and okay. uh, about the total throughput of the uh, OER uh, memory. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so we know that for anaerobic digestion, hydrogen sulfide concentration can be varied widely. For example, it can be from 500 ppm to 10,000 ppm. So nearly 1% of the biogas composition, but it depends on the feed stock of the anaerobic digestion and also the some process parameters re regarding the anaerobic digestion process. So, so far we use the up to 650 ppm hydrogen sulfide in our bioreactor configuration, but now we are doing our experiment to scale up the performance and still it's not to the 100%, but if we see the, our reactor configuration, if you can remember the reactor configuration I have shown, we used only one small membrane module. So membrane surface area was, um, it's about 0 0.013 square meter. So if we increase the volume, so membrane is very good and it is used for the high surface volume ratio. So if we increase the volume of the membrane module and if we scale up, hopefully it will capable to uh, remove the hydrogen sulfide concentration close to the concentration present in anaerobic digestion. But still, we are doing the experiments regarding this. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the Thank you. nice answering. And uh, uh, our next uh, question is also uh, um, membrane. And uh, I think Richen, uh, Richen would like to ask Harish. So about the separating of VFA from water has always been challenging, and he's curious about uh, your, how many how many types of membrane can be used, and uh, uh, do you work on modifying the surface properties of the membrane? And uh, uh, yes, thank you for the question, uh, Richard. And uh, yes, uh, uh, for the moment, what we do is uh, what they have been doing is they are trying to use hydrophobic membranes for. Uh, separation of VFAs and uh, generally the more hydrophobic the membrane, uh, it has got better permeation for VFAs in specific. And there are studies where they looked at modifying modifying membranes for VFA separation and and one study looked at using PTFE uh, membrane with uh, TOA that is trioctylamine. Uh, so they blended both together and, and they made a modified membrane and that actually enhanced the separation of VFAs in that case. Uh, for the moment, I'm not looking uh, at preparing any uh, blended or uh, coated membrane here in, at NUIG, uh, but that is, an, uh, that is a way to go about by changing the properties and being very specific for a particular membrane. Yes, you can do that. Okay, and the uh, second question for you is that, uh, have you tried the technology on real digestate? Uh, the cheese made digestate, yes, we did try. Uh, so that was another study which 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 I worked with, with another colleague of mine. Yes. So what we did is we integrated uh, the anaerobic cheese whey digestate. I mean, the cheese whey uh, uh, fermentate, and uh, we integrated the silicon membrane uh, uh, contactor with the with anaerobic digestate. And what we observed was that there were a few advantages of using this uh, SMC. One was uh, the reduced requirement of uh, an alkali alkali to maintain the pH of the reactor. And the second thing was the separation was still observed and this silicon membrane was very specific and uh, it didn't uh, allow any other ions except alcohols pass through them. So, so the, the draw solution had VFAs and alcohols in them. So it was a bit specific and uh, so we are still working on that study and we've also compiled a few information and we have, we have submitted to a journal for uh, publication. Yes, we are, we did try for our jet digestate. Thank you. Okay, thanks. And uh, oh, 
Uh, excuse me. OK, Richard asked you again. Uh, short chain VFA are generally not that uh, <coughs> hydrophobic. So maybe that's why you observe <coughs> low efficiency for uh, acetic or butyric acid. Sorry, I cannot publish this one. Oh, it's already published. Oh, so, sorry, Richen. Uh, Richen said the short chain VFA are generally not that uh, uh, hyperphobic. So maybe that's why you observe the low efficiency, efficiency for acetic and butyric acids. So you, you agree? Oh, please, uh, please unmute your microphone, please. Your microphone is mute. Yeah, yeah. So I opened it. Yes. Okay. Uh, so the, the shorter the carbon chain, the less hydrophobic it is. So it doesn't move across the membrane. So yes, it is right. So the longer the carbon chain, you have uh, the, the compound is more hydrophobic and silicon membrane does like hydrophobic compounds and it does let these hydrophobic compounds to pass across them. Yes, that is right. OK. OK, thanks. Th uh, thanks, Harish. Uh, our next question is on the uh, nutrient recovery by membrane. I think uh, it's not uh, indicated the presenter. I think it might be for Dijon or Lin. The question is, uh, has there been much res research into the use of gas membrane technology to recover uh, ammonium or ammonium sulfate fertilizer production? And uh, can the fertilizer produced be used to offset uh, carbon emissions from ag agriculture? Anyone? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, lots of studies about using the gas membrane to recover ammonia. But um, and, uh, and uh, generate product of the ammonia, ammonium sulfate as a uh, fertilizer. But yeah, lots of studies have done about this area. But, uh, the, uh, but I just know electric uh, dialysis compared to the membrane, get, uh, the gas membrane technology. The electrodialysis is the more promotion technology because it's uh, economical, economical friendly. It uh, saves lots of energy compared to the gas membrane because the gas membrane technology needs two lots of energy to heating for heating. And the use, yeah, that's um, that's all uh, um, I know. Okay, thanks. Do you have something to add, Lee? <laughs> if not, we will go to the next one. <laughs> okay. Uh, Okay, and uh, there are also a uh, lot of people are very interested in Yuan Sheng's study. I found Yuan Sheng have answered uh, some, uh, some of the technical um, questions in the Q&A box already. And uh, mm, I think, so Yuan Sheng, would you like to introduce the perspective of your technology and the maybe uh, the uh, shortcut and what's the problem and between the mm, real application of this technology on the market? Okay, thank you. Thank you, yeah. Um, and thank you for um, interest in my presentation. So uh, I think the major um, for the perspective, I think the most important uh, um, thing is uh, uh, this technology uh, we, uh, to select uh, out uh, floating like algae can potentially overcome the harvesting and dewatering problem in um, large scale algae by fuel production because these two steps are the most uh, um, um, costed um, in terms of both economic uh, aspect and uh, energetic uh, aspect. So this uh, by our filtration, um, um, this technology can overcome this potentially overcome these issues. But the main challenge uh, I think I'm thinking is the you know the cultural control. Now um, we can guarantee we can uh, we have selection of the outer floating American algae, but uh, we don't have control of this uh, uh, of the specific um, species or strains. For example, we cannot guarantee the outer um, uh, floating American algae uh, have very high lipid content if the purpose is for by diesel production. Uh, but uh, uh, overall, um, 
uh, we, 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 we observed a very high uh, carbohydrate content. So maybe it's a, it's a not, uh, alternatively, we can use this uh, uh, McLaggy to uh, for produce other biofilms like uh, um, by gas and by ethanol and by butanol uh, instead of um, by diesel. So the other, the other um, um, problem yet to be resolved or, or challenges yet to be resolved uh, is uh, um, how to upscale this technology uh, in continuous cultivation because now we have like a lab scale uh, photoreactors so it's easier to achieve very good separation efficiency but uh, uh, just imagine in large scales um, production we have large like egg pound and uh, so the efficiency may not as good as the lab system so upscale uh, would be a uh, um, key issue to adjust in, in, in our future study. Okay. Okay, thanks. Mm. Thanks, Yuan Shu. Yeah. And uh, I'll find you. Okay, I think at present, uh, almost all the questions have been covered. Mm. And uh, anyone else have some new questions? I think this might be a, a time to uh, bring an end to the symposium. I, I, uh, I think we've gone through all our presentations. We've had lots of questions and I want to thank you, Yang, for uh, chairing that last session so well. Um, uh, and I want to thank everybody who's been in the audience. Our audience has varied from 127. Uh, I think there was about 75 stayed till the very end. Um, I think this was a fantastic synthesis of research, asking people to keep their three or four years of work into six slides can be a very, very, very difficult task. So I think there's great credit to all the presenters for sticking to time, uh, for sticking to six slides, for presenting their very deep science very, very well. Uh, I often find that the bigger symposia, people want the overview, they want the policy perspective, uh, and I think with the type of scientists that we have, we do like deep science. We do like to look at direct interspecies electron transfer. We do like to look at very deep science. It's not always um, as relevant as the broad science, but we do depth. Uh, and what we're always looking for is some intellectual copyright that will lead to making our world a better place. I think one thing that's very apparent is, is anaerobic digestion cannot be compared to a wind turbine. It's quite complex. We're dealing with agriculture, we're dealing with cheese plants, with whiskey distilleries, with duckweed, with nutrient management plants, uh, with improved efficiency. We're looking at partial pressures of gas. It's, it's a very, very complicated area when you're looking at biomethane, biorefineries, circular economy, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, control systems, SCADA systems. So I want to thank you all for explaining your fantastic science. Uh, I also want to pay particular gratitude to Tara Reddington and to Aoife Dunn. Uh, this was meant to be a physical conference. We put it online. We've had 26 presentations in probably 26 different rooms across this island and maybe outside this island. It's been a great undertaking. We had a few technical glitches. And I think that's related to the software package itself. It doesn't like more than six people to be on video at one time. It struggles when someone takes the control. So I think technology caused us some challenges, but I really must thank Tara and Aoife for dealing with those. I want to thank our two chairs, Jan and uh, Archie, uh, and we had a great day. Thank you all very, very much, and I hope you have a good uh, May Bank holiday weekend. Thank you, Jerry.